community. I'm here to do my Vinyl Tag 2020 video. Uh, I've watched a number of responses so far and they've all been pretty enjoyable. Uh, if you're considering making a video uh, but haven't quite worked up the courage, this is really the time to do it because it's a good highlight of what one's collection is like. Uh, so that's why I like these. I think this is the fourth or fifth one. Uh, but anyway, let's get into it. First question is, Best find of 2019. I had a hard time boiling it down to one, so I'm gonna show two. Uh, the first one was one I didn't think I'd ever own on vinyl. This is a Japanese artist named Carmen Maki, and she's teamed up with the Blues Creation. She's done a couple albums with them. Uh, the Blues Creation uh, is a blues rock band, and Carmen Maki was making albums into the late, starting in the late 60s. Uh, her father is uh, an American GI that was stationed in Japan. But anyway, this is just a fantastic album. I've had it on CD. Uh, the one disappointing thing for me is that it's missing the Obi, but you know, I am very happy to get it. Uh, it was a total luck find. Um, but anyway, here's a sampling of what this one's like. Second album isn't super obscure and it's fairly attainable. Um, this is a uh, left field, low tempo uh, duo out of the UK uh, called The Deadbeats. Uh, this is their album Lounging and this one is actually 20 years old. <laughs> so it kind of works well with another question that we'll get into. Uh, but you know, fantastic band, uh, you know, they use samples from multiple places and plus uh, they have some real instrumentation to go with it. I've actually used uh, the, the track Funky For You in a couple of previous videos and folks have asked me what it is. Here's a couple of samples from this one. Next question was favorite album from 2019. Now, I just did a video on 2019 um, and there were several albums that I wanted to include in that video, but I just couldn't get to it. And I actually received one, um, I think like days before I had cut that video, but I hadn't, didn't have a chance to give it a sampling. And this is a VCLT gift from Norman Maslov. 
um, or Massey as he goes by. If you don't know Mr. Maslow, here you go. Anyway, this is Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds Ghost Teen. Now, Nick Cave, first of all, is an acquired taste for some people. Um, his catalog has been very hit or miss for me. And, you know, like a lot of people, I think Boatman's Call is probably his definitive album. Although some people would debate me on that. But Ghost Teen is just fantastic. It's cinematic in scope, um, very well thought through, a good you know, uh, concept all the way through. And this is just a fantastic record. And, you know, I'm still in the process of digesting it, but yeah, this one probably would have made my list of best albums from 2019. A very nice gatefold with a picture of the band. And yeah, if you're a fan of Nick Cave, yeah, this one I would definitely consider essential in his catalog. Definitely worth trying out. So, Mazzy, thank you very much, sir. Next up is Show a Novelty Record. So, many people know that I'm into space-related records, and I kind of have a sub-niche to my collection where I have a bunch of space-related records. And one of my pickups from this year has been Voices of the Satellites. Uh, this is on the Smithsonian Folkways label. They had a whole science series that they did in the 50s. Uh, this particular album came out in 58. And it goes over some of the first satellites ever shot into space. So starting with Sputnik, uh, it covers Like of the Dog. And, you know, it has uh, the first couple of American satellites like Explorer and Vanguard. Um, very interesting to listen because, you know, how early it was in the space program. But here's a cut from this album. Let us tune in Sputnik again on our communication type receiver that we have here in the laboratory and listen to Sputnik as it was going approximately overhead about 400 miles up at 7.39 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, October 21st, 1957. Next question was show an homage cover. And a lot of people have been showing Abbey Road and you know, there's been so many takes on that particular cover. But I'm going to go with the first one that came to mind for me, and that was Kruder and Dorfmeister's G Stoned. Uh, this is an EP that came out in '93. Uh, I remember walking into a record store, I think in '98, and seeing this as a vinyl record. And I'm like, who buys vinyl? That's just crazy. Well, you know, this is a wonderful left field house record. Um, it's fairly well known, but, you know, this is a homage to, of course, Simon and Garfunkel's bookends. So, yeah. This one I can actually do a uh, cut from, so here you go. I really enjoyed this next question. The next question was show a deep cut or a B side. So um, when I was eight or nine, I found a box of 45s that belonged to my mother. And one of the 45s I found in there was from the Turtles. And, uh, you know, I was in love with the track uh, you showed me. And the B side to it, in my opinion, was even better. And it was an, a song called Buzzsaw. And it's on this album, which is The Battle of the Bands. It came out in 68. But Buzzsaw is just fantastic. It just it has one guy saying Buzzsaw on it. And, you know, it has this really fuzzed out bass line. It's just fantastic. But this one I can play a cut for you, so let's play it. Buzz 
Saw. Saw. The sixth question was show something funky. And so I went through my collection and I do have a, um, some funk. Um, and you know, like a lot of people, Parliament, Funkadelic, yeah, I have those, but I wanted to show something different. And some of the things that I found that were different, they're copyright blocks, so I couldn't give you a representative sampling. Like, for example, one of the ones I wanted to show you was this from this band, Sun. And this is uh, You Want to Make Love, Flick My Bick. Just a fantastic song, uh, which is the title of the album, of course. And then you got the lovely cover. But you know, there uh, with a lot of funk, you got that good bass line. And this one features uh, an early version of the Talk Box. Um, you know, '76 was the same year that Peter Frampton's Peter or Frampton Comes Alive comes out, where he used that. And Um, and then you got the, the refrain of the song, uh, Flick My Bick, so <laughs> just a fantastic album. I wish I could play you an extensive cut, but I can't. So what am I going to do for you? Um, this is a comp that came out this year, uh, which is Space Funk. Uh, covering the years uh, 76 to 84. Uh, yeah, sorry about the glare there. Um, but anyway, there is this group called Juju uh, that did this song called Plastic. And um, yeah, it's a really, really fun cut about see through plastic. So here you go. Now, like a lot of people, I was challenged with this next question, which was weird shelf buddies. Now, my collection is fairly well organized by genre. Uh, and a lot of cases like world music, I have it broken down into country. And, you know, there's not too many places where you have polar extremes uh, in terms of the, the musical content. But there was one area where I did have some eh, fairly big musical differences. And so I, I grabbed one of the first ones I saw. And folks are going to be kind of amazed. So I went to soundtracks. And... The, the two albums I'm going to show you, I've never seen the movie, so people are going to say, well, why did you even buy the music? Well, I sampled it online and I enjoyed it. And the other one is kind of a, a cult classic here in the United States. So uh, the first one is the soundtrack to Eyes of My Mother, um, which is a black and white horror movie. Uh, I am curious to watch it. Um, this comes in this wonderful marbled wax. And the composer is Ariel Lowe. This is kind of ambient drone music, something that you would expect from a horror movie. And then next to it was Flashdance. <laughs> um, yeah, so Flashdance is like this uh, iconic 80s movie that had this wonderful so uh, soundtrack. So, uh, you know, you got horror and this kind of uh, uh, upbeat kind of happy movie, or at least I think it's a happy movie. Uh, maybe one of you guys can tell me, but yeah, do, do these genres, are these compatible? The next question was, I was there, 
And uh, the way the question was described was basically, uh, tell us about an artist that you saw live. And this uh, particular question I want to answer with a BCLT album, uh, which I received from Mr. Jeff Kempen. And if you're not familiar with Jeff's channel, here you go. I just love watching Jeff's channel because of his honesty. Uh, if he gets a record he doesn't like, he will definitely say that, unlike kind of glossing things over. Um, so I, I highly recommend Jeff. He has a nice variety uh, of things to show. But anyways, he passed me this Elton John album. Um, this is Elton's first live work, uh, really before he blew up big. and. For an American, this is kind of confusing because you have the, you start with the day. Uh, in the United States, we start with a month. Don't ask me why. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I saw Elton live uh, for free uh, right around 1999. So uh, in my hometown, we had a homosexual college student named Matthew Shepard. Um, that was basically bludgeoned to death, um, and it was very tragic. It was a national news story uh, that made it all over the United States. Uh, it was very surreal for me because my hometown where I'm from is uh, only about 24,000 people, or at least it was at the time. And um, yeah, Elton came to play a benefit concert about a month afterwards. And I just happened to get free tickets to it. And I wasn't sure what to expect because, you know, um, I did enjoy his music and I enjoy it more after seeing the concert. But um, he played for three hours straight. Um, and he was, you know, crossing the age of 50 at the time. And I was just amazed. Um, maybe it was for the benefit, but, you know, other people I've talked to said that, yeah, that's, pretty typical of Elton or Elton during the period that he would play for three hours. So after seeing that show, I got to say that, you know, he puts any most bands to shame by the length of his performance and, you know, the quality as well. Um, you know, it was, it was just an outstanding concert. I was just amazed. And so, you know, I had a soft spot um, in my collection, <laughs> as a matter of fact, for Elton John. So I did not have this record. Uh, Jeff happened to show it on his channel, and I just commented, I was very curious to hear it because I hadn't heard Elton's work um, around this time frame. I mean, you get into like 71, 72, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Mr. Kempton, thank you very much. So the next question was, wish I had an original copy, but I got a repress. So... I don't even have the repress because I don't want the repress. The repress is done by four men with beards who I think anything they put out is an absolute travesty. And not only that, they're using rainbow for their pressings and rainbow is just terrible. Um, they're like United. So I have it on CD and you know, this would have been great for the, the funky question. And so many people have answered with these guys, but this is uh, Funkadelic's uh, Maggot Brain. And this is just a fantastic record. Um, OG copies, even in poor shape, for some re odd reason, go over 70 bucks on uh, Discogs. And I'm like, why would you buy an album that's in poor shape? That, to me, that's just unplayable. But even for, you know, a playable copy, you're talking about $200, $300. And, you know, I like the album, but I'm not willing to spend that kind of money. And, I mean, it, it's, it's going to take a very, 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 very rare record for me to spend, like, over three figures anymore. Um, but, yeah, you know, Maggot Brain, just solid guitar work. Um, yeah, if you haven't heard this album, it is just fantastic. I recommend it. So the next question was discography of an artist 
of which you have their entire catalog or artists that you have the most of. And to be quite honest, you know, answering it both ways, um, it's probably these guys, Led Zeppelin. Um, in the 90s, I heard them, well, you know, I was exposed to them uh, growing up er uh, when I was growing up early, but, you know, it wasn't until the 90s that, you know, um, they really started to click with me, and then I grabbed all their, enti their entire discography. I went after bootlegs. I just could not get enough of this band. And so I had their entire catalog probably four or five times over. Um, so if there was a band that I was an excessive fan of, it's probably these guys. Although I've kind of uh, <laughs> uh, tuned down my fandom a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's, it's Led Zeppelin. You know, there are a lot of artists that I have their entire uh, catalog discography. But uh, Zeppelin is one of those bands I've kind of taken it to the extreme because, you know, of all the bootlegs and then the multiple copies of um, their studio album. So, yeah, that's how I'd answer that one. So the next question will show a unique center label. And the album that first came to my mind was this one, which is Ben Webster's Soulville. And... An OG copy has kind of a normal label, but this is a Vinyl Me Please release. And when I first saw this, I was just, the way they did the label, I was, it blew my mind. Um, the label is actually, was engraved into the stamper and pressed into the record. I've never seen anything like it. It's such a cool concept. So kind of like an etching, but you know. I, I like what they did with this one. So this is how to answer this. Ben Webster, um, if you're not familiar, he's a tenor saxophone player. If there's one album to try of his, it is this one. Unfortunately, I can't play you it because all of his stuff has copyright blocks on YouTube. The next question was show a pre-band or someone that was in a band and then went on to become famous. So I've picked Two different ones for this one because not everyone may know the first. So the first one is Brendan Perry. So this guy right, right here. Um, Brendan Perry is in the band Dead Can Dance, which is kind of a dark wave folk world uh, band. And they're, they have a very unique sound and I've never heard anyone quite like them. So very kind of relaxed and you know it gets into world type instruments and they mix it in um, but he was in this band called the the scavengers which was a new zealand based punk band um, this uh, album is kind of a compilation of all their their tracks which came out in 2003 um, they had a couple of singles that came out uh, in 77 and you know i just I was floored when I found out that he was in a punk band. These guys never made it big, which kind of surprised me, but probably because of some of the lyrics, because uh, they use some explicit language, so maybe that's why, but you know, I thought they could play with the best of them, so here's a cut from this album. <laughs> So I realize that not everyone knew who Brendan Perry is. So maybe this next artist, uh, most people will know. So uh, Brian Johnson of ACDC, second singer. Um, he was in a band called Jordy, and Jordy was just a fantastic hard rock outfit uh, from the UK. And you know, uh, in terms of classic hard rock uh, coming out of the 70s. You can't go wrong with a Jordy album. So here's a cut from this one. The 13th question was show a musical movie or book you would recommend. Um, I haven't 
you know, I don't have a whole lot of time to read anymore. <laughs> yeah, I spend my entire time editing video. Um, but yeah, work reasons, family reasons, it's hard for me to really get into a, a good book and just go all the way through. Um, I do watch movies when I can, and you know, I, I decided to answer this one with uh, a documentary. I could have used a book, but um, I wanted to go with uh, this one, Straight No Chaser, um, featuring Thelonious Monk. Um, this is a wonderful biography of Monk's life, and Clint Eastwood produced this one. Uh, Monk was such a fascinating character, and, you know, his life kind of ended in tragedy, and, you know, it's those unique geniuses in life that, you know, their, their brains are wired a little bit differently from everybody else and Monk was definitely a genius but you know uh, he had you know problems and you know uh, I can't remember if the documentary goes over it but he was prescribed lithium and you know that definitely screwed up his brain or at least his family could attest to and you know for you know in the late 60s and the 70s um, you know, he just kind of shut down. I mean, he would do things, but, you know, uh, even his bandmates would say, yeah, he might say one sentence in an entire month. So, um, very interesting to watch. Uh, the documentary is well done. Of course, it has Clint Eastwood's backing. So, uh, I do highly recommend checking this one out. So, the next question was show an underrated album. There were a number of records I could have picked for this one but I had to pick one of my honest favorites and it's not a go-to album for them that a lot of people go up and go for and that is Los Lobos Colossal Head. Now uh, I'd love to give you a sample of this one but of course uh, all of their catalog is blocked on YouTube uh, for copyright claims. Um, this is just a wonderful blend of you know uh, some of the, the Latino music um, but it also has, you know, uh, of course, the blues uh, pieces that they put in, and there's some wonderful folk. So it's very diverse, um, and I just really, really enjoy it. And when I recommend it to people, they're like, eh, Colossal Head, I've never heard of that one. Um, but I really enjoy Los Lobos as a band, and, you know, I, I have most of their discography. But this is definitely one of their top albums for me, and I consider it very underrated. The next question was show an artist with a good batting average or one that you know has had a consistently solid output and again I'm going with the one that first came to my mind um, and you know it shouldn't be a shocker but you know it's the Beatles and you know uh, the Beatles in my opinion it was good that it ended when it did I, you know some people might say that's blasphemy um, but, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, stopping when you're ahead. And I, I think when they ended, that was probably a, a good thing. I mean, with Abbey Road, I mean, that, that was kind of the capstone on a career. And if they had continued, would they have continued with the same type of output? I mean, I look at the Beatles solo career, and while there are some good albums, um, I don't think any of those solo albums... Uh, even come close to you know what they did with their entire catalog I mean you look at the artistry you look at the variety I mean the, the first album that they put out uh, is very very different from the last and you know you had four people that you know uh, were at the top of their artistic game um, you know they all contributed to the songs uh, which is very different from a lot of bands because you know with a lot of bands, you probably have one or two guys that you know have are really carrying the band, but not in the case of the Beatles. So even their, some of their weakest albums. So like I, I pulled this one deliberately. So Magical Mystery Tour. So this album, for whatever reason, you know, does not get high acclaim. But you look at the the, the songs that were on it. So Hello Goodbye, Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, um, All You Need Is Love. I mean, four, four or five solid tracks on this album, which is better than a lot of bands. Um, 
So yeah, uh, that's how I'd answer that one, the Beatles. So uh, Beatles is another one where I have their entire discography. Uh, I'm not a super fan, so to speak, but man, I really, really love their musical output. Next question was show an album uh, or same album with different cover. And I had to grab an album from this year actually. And uh, there's a little bit of frustration with the story I'm gonna tell you because uh, the cover that I really like kind of got screwed up. But anyway, this is Loops in the Secret Society by Jane Weaver. Uh, she is an electronic musician and she's been around close to two decades now. Um, yeah. This is just a wonderful album, and this is one of the ones that I had to cut at the last minute uh, when I did my 2019 video, but I grabbed the alternate cover by mistake because I thought it was a new album, and it was on Pink Wax, and this is the alternate cover. Um, I like it because I like this photo of her uh, better than the, the foil one with kind of the, the uh, title of the album, but look. so. I got the box in the mail and it was dented and yeah, I am so frustrated by this. Um, but we don't play the covers, do we? But you know, I love the album. So Jane Weaver, Loops in the Secret Society. Here you go. So the next question is show an album that you bought cheaply that's now worth money. Now most of my collection is not even Discogs. I don't, I'm not the type of person that will go back and take a look and see what the value is. I only happen to know that this is value because somebody else featured it or commented that they really really wanted it. And I bought it just as I was getting back into vinyl. Uh, I purchased it at a Fry's for like 15 bucks. And that is Madonna's Celebration Collection. So this is a four LP set. Um, yeah, this one easily goes for uh, two to $300 now. So, um, yeah, I, I was just amazed that, yeah, it went for that much and I happened to pick it up for 15 bucks at the time. <laughs> the next question is show your favorite drummer. So if you asked me two decades ago uh, who my favorite drummer was, I would easily say it was John Bottom. But in this past decade, since I've really gotten into jazz, uh, within a sh beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is Mr. Art Blakey. Um, Art Blakey is just, you know, in terms of technique and um, how he mentored other musicians and was an inspiration for so many drummers to come. Uh, I, by far, he is my favorite drummer, and I think he's going to be a hard one to top just because of um, his technique and what he did for jazz music. Um, this just happens to be a signed copy from Mr. Blakey. Um, if you're watching me and you're not familiar with uh, Art Blakey, here's just a small taste. So we're winding down, we're getting towards the end. Um, this question is turning 20. Show an album that is turning 20 this year. And a lot of people have shown Kid A from Radiohead, wonderful album, you know, Rage Against the Machine, Renegades. Um, there's been a few others that, you know, are, are slipping my mind. Um, but for me, I had to go with this artist, which really 
defined the start of the millennium for me and that is bent program to love um, a lot of people aren't familiar with bent um, i've actually talked about them before in other videos uh, they are an electronic based duo um, the music is left field down tempo um, using samples from all over the place what i like about them too uh, you know i mentioned the beatles and the variety uh, these guys are very much in the same vein um, they use female vocals on a lot of their tracks um, they also use modern instrumentation so uh, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea but uh, this album you know i just played it continuously for two or three years straight and i still like to revisit this album like yeah, i would say every few months i am returning to this one uh just because it's it's relaxed vibe so uh in terms of albums turning 20 this one uh, definitely got the most play time and so this is why i am featuring this one um, i do want to try and squeeze in a few samples uh, although all their music is copyright blocked i want to see if i can get by with just a small little touch of what they're like so you know hopefully i might just might be able to sell them a little bit more to a few more people that are watching me now so there you go <music> Next question is uh, show a trilogy of albums, so a, a solid trilogy back to back to back of albums that were really, really good. And I am not the biggest hip hop music fan. Um, I did enjoy it in the 80s. I loved it in uh, the early 90s, but once it hit about 95 or so, um, you know, I, some of the stuff coming out did not you know, resonate with me. It's not to say there wasn't an exception here or there, uh, but one of my favorite bands uh, growing up, uh, hip hop acts, uh, were some of the originators, Run DMC. So, King of Rock, Raising Hell, and Tougher Than Leather. These three, you know, if there are albums to own by Run DMC, uh, it's these three guys. These are just fun, fantastic albums. So, yeah, that's how I would answer that last question. So, the last part was uh, talk about or give some shout outs to some VC members. Now, um, uh, previous vinyl tags, uh, I kind of, you know, held off on doing anything because, you know, I have a lot of people that are subscribed to me and vice versa. Um, and I, I honestly wish everyone sub to me uh, had thousands and thousands of subscribers um, because, you know, there's a lot of good content being made. And I really enjoy a lot of the people making videos. I mean, there are people that may only have 100, 200 subs and, you know, I just love their channels. Um, but I decided to uh, talk about three different ones this year. So uh, the first one is uh, Moni Muse, uh, Monica. So she just started making videos this year. Again, I love seeing more women uh, making videos because this is such a male dominated hobby. And uh, Monica uses, uh, you know, real, really professional techniques uh, in, in terms of making her video content. Um, she does a lot of nice editing. Um, and I highly recommend checking her out. I think she's a little over 200 subs now. Um, she is definitely going to go on to get a whole lot more. Uh, the next is another woman uh, that has joined the VC, and she hails from uh, Canada, the, the French-speaking part of Canada, and that is Miss Lady Soul, and I think she's originally from Haiti. Um, she did a, a contest a while back, which I wish I could have participated in, but she shows a lot of solo records, which I don't think get a whole lot of um, recognition here in the VC. And plus she talks about uh, records from her native countries. Um, and uh, 
it's so wonderful to hear the passion and her discovery of you know some of the rock classics that a lot of us take for granted. The last person that I kind of like to highlight is Michael Muller. So uh, a video or two ago, uh, I featured the band uh, Balmore, and uh, Michael had sent me some VCLT. Um, and he was asking me about doing a video and, you know, I recommended doing the Vinyl Tag 2020 and he took me on, took me up on the offer of doing his, his first video for the Vinyl Tag. And, you know, I am trying to promote him and get him some more subs. So, uh, yeah, those are the three shout outs I'd like to give. Again, there's a bunch of people that watch me that, you know, uh, they're still in the 100, 200 range. And, you know, I, I, I'd like to get them more. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you for watching me thus far. And uh, I'm looking forward to see what next year's questions are like.